Uncover and Elevate is the next evolution of Liberate Your People Pleaser. I'm Brenda Florida, Certified Life Coach, and after coaching hundreds of clients, I am unapologetically clear on this. People pleasing is a symptom with a deeper cause. Being in a toxic relationship or career and feeling trapped has a deeper cause. Avoiding difficult conversations has a deeper cause. Self-sabotage, imposter syndrome, confusion, feeling insecure, all have a deeper cause. In Uncover and Elevate, we are going to look under the hood every week to uncover what the deeper causes are that shape our lives, including the ones that make breaking a pattern, even one we want to break, so hard. Then we will elevate our lives with tools designed to transform those deeper causes and deal with the symptoms. Join me each week as we uncover and elevate our lives. And now, here's this week's episode of Uncover and Elevate. Someone asked me recently to give them the quick elevator pitch for what I do as a life coach. And I said, you know, really what I am in the business of doing is helping people break habits that don't serve them anymore and replace them with habits that do serve them. Now we could always turn that the other way and say, I also help people start habits that will serve them um, and be able to dissolve um, the blocks to that, right? Like when we're trying to start a habit, then there are blocks that keep us from getting in a new habit when we're trying to stop something same difference really there are blocks that keep us from stopping something and so one of the first things that i want to share with you about how all of this works and some of how i'm able to do this with people because it's been quite effective um and the results my clients have had you know have been astounding in all sorts of areas from habits that were keeping them limited professionally, habits that kept them feeling um, unhappy in their body, habits that kept them into relationships that were, you know, anywhere from abusive to just not, you know, good for them anymore, whether they were romantic relationships or work relationships. Um, It's, I've had clients with transformations on all kinds of relationship change, moving into new kinds of relationship, changing their habits and their patterns on how they are in, again, romantic relationships, relationships with their parents at work, all kinds of things. And all of it really falls under this idea that we have habits that keep us doing things that don't serve us. And then it's really hard to switch into the habits that will serve us. So I want to break this down today because it's so important and how, you know, it's really a huge part of the uncovering that has to happen before we can really elevate our lives at any sort of sustainable level. So if any of you have been listening to me for very long, you probably know or have heard me say this. I am all about what I think of as sustainable transformation. So the equivalent metaphor would be, I'm not trying to help people lose 10 pounds for a wedding. (laughs) Excuse me. If you want to lose 10 pounds, I want you to lose that forever, right? Not yo-yo back and forth. So one of the first steps to being able to do that and create something that is really sustainable, a change that's really permanent is first of all, understanding that there is a big gap between the awareness of something that isn't serving us or something we want to start that we know would serve us and being able to actually change that. So a lot of times we have this impression or this idea that once we're aware of something, we should be able to change it. You know, the sort of quote of when I know better, I can do better. Well, it's true. You have to know better first before you can do better. So the awareness is absolutely key. And we don't go anywhere until we get that awareness. But most of us underestimate 
that gap between, okay, I'm aware this isn't serving me. And so now I do it differently, you know, or I don't do it or whatever the, you know, response would be based on what it is you want to change. And probably the single biggest reason that that's the case, why it's so hard, why there's such a big gap is because breaking a habit or starting a habit is very much a mindset game. It's very much in your thoughts. Your feelings will come along, but your thoughts are what keeps you stuck where you are. The, and I'll say, even if it doesn't seem like it on the surface, like that might be real obvious to you, depending on whatever limitation, whatever habit you're thinking about right now, as I'm talking about this, it, it may be really obvious to you that it is a thought about it, which is really what I mean by mindset. It's because you have thoughts that keep you stuck there, even though you also have thoughts that say, I want to do something different. So one of my best tools for you today is for you to be able to actually identify what that thought is. Now that's going to take some work on your own. And this is why a lot of people start, I would say, you know, probably 75%, if not more of the clients who come to work with me all start out with some story or statement that is this very thing. Now they're going to fill in the blank for whatever the challenges in their life that they're struggling with. But just like, um, for instance, I've had clients come to me because they feel like they're always doing something that ruins their romantic relationships, or they want to get into a new romantic relationship, right? So they're going to start dating or something. And they know they tend to pick the wrong kind of people. So they know they have this habit of choosing the wrong person or this habit that keeps them in relationships that are not serving them, but they don't know how to stop. They don't know how to break it. So the first thing it, that, that we have to do in the coaching process, because I always, I love that. I love that they have the awareness um, that it's not serving them or they need to do something different that will, but they don't know how to do that thing, or they don't know what that thing is. And so the first thing that we do when we get into our work together is start to identify the thoughts that are connected to that, because there's some kind of thought that says to someone in an abusive relationship, but there's still something, you know, in essence, scarier about leaving this relationship than staying. So now this is where, you know, we get into my, my other catchphrase I use so often of looking under the hood, right? So this is why one-on-one -on -one coaching works so well in these habit-breaking scenarios or habit-starting scenarios, because it takes a while to peel back the layers and figure out what that actually is. The reason why somebody stays in a relationship that is abusive are not exactly the same. So we have to get to your specific thing, but as much as you can see this in yourself and, and cultivate the awareness in yourself, look at the thought that keeps you there. There is a thought about uh, not deserving something more or not being worthy of something more, or not good enough for it, or you won't be loved again if you do this or if you leave that relationship or it might mean you're a bad person. It might mean you've done something wrong. Like there, there, and it's not just one thought. It's going to be a whole little collection, a whole pile of thoughts <laughs> that have built up in your mind and in your subconscious over time that make breaking that habit so hard. Because even though consciously you may be totally aware, totally ready, okay? But subconsciously, you've got these contradictory thoughts. Now, the reason why that doesn't end up creating change or any sustainable change is because your subconscious mind is like 90% of your mind. It's 90% of what we're thinking and feeling. And so it is a much bigger prediction of how we're going to think, feel, and act than our conscious mind is. 
So for instance, for those of you who have heard my video story, my story that I tell on a video about the years that I was without a home, what that boiled down to after I peeled back many layers and had coaches who helped me peel back the layers was that subconsciously I did not feel worthy of the life I wanted. Now, consciously, that wasn't the case at all. So it took me a while to get there because I, even though nothing I was doing was working and I was not moving seemingly towards the life I wanted, I couldn't make any sense of it because I was so clear consciously. But there was this more powerful subconscious part that kept telling me I wasn't worthy. And so that's what, at the end of the day, ended up quote unquote winning and made my struggle so long and lengthy. As I started resolving that and changing my thoughts, which changed my feelings to feeling more worthy, I started to, you know, find more opportunities and make more money and, you know, in change those circumstances. But it was because I changed what I was thinking first. And that's almost always where real change comes from, because that's, which is different than the idea of willpower, which is, you know, the lose 10 pounds for the wedding is just, can I muscle through this? Can I, you know, buckle down and throw all my willpower at it and not eat as much and exercise more or whatever to drop this 10 pounds. Well, we can willpower and muscle our way through all kinds of things. Okay. But they're, but they're not sustainable in that way. They're, we can't sustain a transformation or a change in our lives until we really change how we think and feel about that thing. Okay. And so the most powerful tool gift I can give you today may seem too simple. So, you know, you, there might be a part of your mind that wants to dismiss it, but it's really about finding the thoughts that are supporting the belief, whether the, or the habit habits and beliefs are very similar, but whatever is supporting that habit, whether it's a habit, you know, you want to stop, or, you know, you want to start whatever thoughts are keeping you where you are, that's what you need to know. You need to identify what those thoughts are. And once you get there, then you can start to do some of the mindset work like I've given you in the past that is it true? One of my favorites in this case for habit breaking is to just go straight to the opposite of it. Like if you have a habit of, I had a habit of uh, not going to the gym, not getting any exercise, not doing any movement. And one of the thoughts behind that, it was that I wasn't athletic. Okay. So I had this thought that, well, I'm not athletic. So kind of like, it's just not for me. And yet everybody <laughs> needs movement. So I also had this other part of me that's like, yeah, but I am bound to feel better physically, mentally, spiritually, when I'm moving my body, because there's too much science to say that is so, to try to pretend that it's true for everybody but me. So you could say, I'm trying to break the habit of being too much of a couch potato or start the habit of getting more movement. However you want to look at that, it doesn't matter. What the thought block was, was I'm not athletic, so I don't like to do those things and I won't be good at those things like all, you know, so there's just a whole little series of thoughts. Now you notice the way I articulated those thoughts is very simple because I've been doing this for a long time. So I've learned this, but it takes a little practice to get your thought. You, a lot of times a thought like that will come in a very complicated way. Well, you know, I had this and that happened to me and then that happened. And so now this and then that. And so I don't think this, and you know, like it's very complex. So just that's okay. Like regurgitate that complex thought. This is where journaling and writing things down is really helpful. And then start to simplify it or that in that very complex thought are several very simple thoughts. 
but it's always easiest to do our mindset work from a very, very simple thought. So one of the ways I like to coach people through this is the idea of like, let's say you needed to describe this thought to a five-year-old, how would you say it? So, you know, you would just be, oh, it's that I don't think I'm athletic. I don't think I'm good enough to, you know, I'll be able to actually do it, have any success. And I don't want to go to the gym and feel like a loser all the time. Um, you know, I don't want to feel bad about my body. I, I don't, I compare myself to other people in the gym and that makes me feel bad, you know, just keeping it simple, but get them out and write them down is very helpful. Instead of just keeping them in your head and get all those thoughts out because those thoughts are between you and that habit change. Okay. But we can't, change the thought until we've really identified it. And this is again, why a lot of times affirmations don't work because we're trying to go to the affirmation without really knowing what the block is to it. And so we say the affirmation, but that block chimes in and is like, no, you know, bullshit, you're lying. That's not true. You know, whatever. And sort of talks us out, excuse me, out of it. So we have to really identify these thoughts and then go to them one by one to start to sort of dissolve them is the way I like to think of it or diminish their power in us. And so, you know, I love my question. Is it true? Uh, I'm not athletic. Is that true? I can only answer yes or no. And it has to be absolute hundred percent. Well, at a minimum, I don't really know because I've not done enough athletic things in my life to know if I'm athletic. Um, but then if I use my second tool, which is what if I just turn that to the opposite and try to find ways that that could at least be true. So I am athletic. Well, how could that be true? Oh, well, actually, when I was a kid, I played basketball and was really good at it. I was very good at tetherball. I was decent at gymnastics. I never pursued it very much, but I was, you know, when we would have it as part of our gym curriculum, I did pretty well in gymnastics. So, huh, maybe actually I am athletic and it's just that I never did anything to pursue anything athletic as a kid. And so by the time I got to be an adult, I just sort of internally labeled myself as not athletic. Oh, okay. So see now that, cause that makes sense to me. Like that's true. Everything I just said is totally true. I went to a high school where we were on split sessions because it was overcrowded. And so you had to choose either an athletic track or a music track because the music people went to school in the morning and the um, athletes trained in the morning, went to school in the afternoon. So you couldn't be involved in music and be in any athletics um, because they were practicing while, while morning session was in school. So I was always a big singer. And so, uh, of course, I picked music. Um, but even the things, again, just from gym class, I knew I was pretty good at basketball, tetherball, swimming. I was a good swimmer, uh, gymnastics. But I couldn't try for, out for the swim team because the swim team was practicing when I was in school. So I happened to be in a circumstance that kind of kept me away from somebody who wasn't naturally inclined to athletics. My high school, at least circumstances um, of the school I was in kept me out of it. So by the time I'm out of high school and I've never done a sport and my, my family, my mom didn't get us into like, um, you know, local community sports and stuff like I had my kids in some when they were little playing basketball and different things um, my mom didn't do any of that so I didn't play if it wasn't happening at school I wasn't you know involved in it so I get to my uh, young adult years you know would have been college but I was I got married and I've never you know I've really never done anything athletic so that was just a very easy story to create for myself and I have owned that story my whole life, you know, and if, until a few years ago. And a few years ago, I started to challenge that. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Is that really true that I'm not athletic? Like, how would I even know? How do I, you know, it's like saying I'm not a good cook, but I've never tried to cook anything. So 
it starts to dissolve. It starts to disempower those thoughts. So identify the thoughts that are keeping you stuck in your pattern or away from, you know, the, the habit you want to create and then do the work on that thought process of, is it true? And that has to be a hundred percent. Absolutely. No, if ands or buts, just yes or no, is it true? And then turn and whether it is or it isn't turn it to the opposite. And how could, could that be true? So when I first started doing this, like I didn't know, could, could the opposite statement that I'm athletic be true? I don't know, but at least leaving the possibility of it open is more freeing to me, starts to close that gap between not doing the habit I want to do and doing it. Because now I've at least created the space of questioning it. Well, you know, maybe that's not really true. So maybe I'll stop saying that about myself. Okay. So if I quit telling myself I wasn't athletic, then what? Oh, okay. So then maybe that takes me to my next thought. Oh, I'm, I, you know, I think I'm not going to be good at anything. Okay. Is that true? Well, how would I know? Again, absolutely. I don't know. Cause I haven't tried very many things. So it the whole forcing yourself into the absolute hundred percent in the yes and only yes or no in the, is it true question is what makes that powerful. If we allow ourselves descriptors with our, well, if I do this, I'm no good at that. Nah, nah, nah. Oh, but have you tried spin class? Have you ever tried a cycling? No. Okay. Well, maybe that's going to be the thing you're good at. So you don't know absolutely that you're not good going to be good at anything at the gym, you know? So it's that because our intention here is to poke the hole in it, to find the break that says, Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that thought I've been saying to myself over and over isn't true or doesn't have to be true. People do this with money. You know, I'm bad at money or if, as, uh, at handling money. So I don't want to make a lot of money. If I make a lot of money, the government's just going to take it, you know, all in taxes. And, you know, they have all these stories about, which are just thoughts, stories are just, you know, thoughts about money and how having money actually won't be good. And then they're frustrated because they want more money. So the habit to break there is that thought habit of, I'm not good at handling money. The government's just going to take it, you know, whatever your thought is. I've coached people on all of those, which is why they come to mind. Um, <laughs> because it is that thought that is between you and breaking or starting a habit. And of course, it's never rare or rarely anyway, just one thought. It's usually a whole little series of thoughts that stack themselves and they become this, you know, unsurmountable mountain to cross. And so as we can disempower them one by one by one by one, then all of a sudden, instead of a, you know, huge mountain to cross, we've just got a tiny creek to le leap over, you know, and we can do that when the gap gets small, then you can leap yourself over it. But when the gap between what you want to do or don't want to do, you know, the habit you want to break or start is big, then it's too hard to get over it. And, you know, like I said, even if you do it under willpower and sort of forcing yourself, you'll just go right, you'll reset because your subconscious mind is so much more powerful than your conscious mind. And so what the process of all this inner work does actually is get it to where now I've consciously thought I am athletic or I'm at least athletic enough. And I can have success in the gym that I've said that over and over enough that that's what's now in my subconscious because the, the stuff in your subconscious, it's not magic. It's just the things you've thought so many times. You don't have to think about them to think about them anymore. Like you don't have to think about how you brush your teeth. Okay. You just know, you just go in and pick up your toothbrush and you know how to do that. You don't have to think about that. That's because many years ago, you did think about that enough. And your parents helped you enough with it that 
you got so good at it that now you get to do it without thinking about it. Driving a car, same way. There's lots of things you know you do all the time without thinking about them that at one point in your life, you didn't know how to do. And that's all this thought work stuff is. It is, I've been telling myself this one thought, I'm not athletic, I'm not athletic, I'm not athletic. For, you know, for me, it was 55 years probably. <laughs> um, and that was so embedded in my subconscious that even when my conscious mind got towards the sort of awareness and awakeness of realizing like whether I'm really into athletic endeavors or not, my body needs to move. I'm going to be healthier. I'm going to feel better. I'm you know going to sleep better. I'm going to all the things better because I'm moving my body. So I want to do that. So I want to start that habit. Well, that's just up there in that five or 10% of my conscious mind and all that. Nope. You're not athletic. You're not athletic. You're not athletic. It's not going to work for you. All that is much more powerful until I create a new series of repetitive thoughts consciously that are, nope, none true. I am athletic. I'm athletic enough. I'm good at spin. I can do yoga. I can do, you know, stretch class. I can row. I can swim. I can do these things. Um, and, and that's how I'm, I want to get my movement. And so once I've said that enough to myself, that's my subconscious. And so on the day that I don't really feel like or whatever, then my more powerful subconscious comes in and says, nope, you're going to be good at this. This is going to work. This is going to be good. And now I am in a new habit that is serving me in a way I can sustain it. Like when I started back at the gym last year for the first time in many years, and I, I have never, I think until now, six months was probably the tops that I ever joined a gym or was consistent at all with any kind of exercise. I think in my past, usually it'd been probably more like three months would be probably normal that I would willpower myself into or conscious mind, quote unquote, motivate myself into, no, this is going to be good for you. Do it, do it, do it, you know, and maybe can sustain it for two or three months. But because I hadn't dug into that deeper subconscious work, I hadn't thought about it that way. Like I didn't have this equation, so to speak. So if you take away nothing um, from this podcast, I, this is the equation I want you to take with you, which is that when something, and really this can apply to anything, isn't working in your life, it's because you have a series of thoughts that keep you in that place where those things are not working. And understanding that is only the beginning, right? So that's where you start to have that awareness and that's great because you've got to have it. But you, then you've got to have the tools either from you know something I've shared with you today to that you can do on yourself, which is very hard. This is where one-on-one -on -one coaching is so powerful because it's much easier to make deeper change when someone else is coaching you through it than it is to self-coach yourself. And that, that's true even for me. And, you know, this is my profession, but in the same way, doctors don't operate on themselves, sort of. Um, I often need another coach who will hear what I'm saying and help me find the deeper thought that I can't find by myself. So just know that you're in good company, that there's nothing wrong with you, that you can't seem to break this habit or you know start a new one. Um, it's just part of the journey and it's part of the value of working one-on-one, -on -one, at least with me. Again, I can only speak for myself as a coach, uh, but that's where the one-on-one -on -one relationship is really, really empowering and powerful. Um, but I hope just from today and what we've talked about, you can put this sort of um, process into motion for yourself to really um, isolate the thought. And again, there's going to be more than one. And then try working the, you know, is it absolutely true? 100% only yes or no. And or, okay, if I do the opposite, then can I find ways that that could be true? And being able to find those ways it could be true, 
you know, not doesn't have to be right. So like, like, let's switch it to a totally different kind of example, like a client I had who was in an emotionally abusive relationship and couldn't leave, even though they saw that it was emotionally abusive, they, they completely understood that and understood their role in tolerating it and all the things, but nor could they leave it. And part of the not being able to leave it was this idea that they wouldn't be loved again by anyone. And so we had to work on that thought and that's a deep one. And that takes more than five minutes or you know a session or two to take a thought that's as gripping and detrimental is as one that is like that, that you're not gonna be loved again and take the power out of it so like a balloon, you know, that has a slow leak, it finally just, you know, fizzles out and then replace it with the thoughts that are empowering. No, I deserve to be treated with respect, with love, with care, with kindness, with compassion. I will be loved. I am loved and I will continue to be loved in the future. Like to to get those thoughts deeper than the conscious mind and into the subconscious mm -hmm. takes some time. So part of the journey is about self-compassion and not judging ourselves for not moving fast enough or something like that, um, or figuring it out ourselves. There's still stigma around hiring a coach, hiring a therapist, as if we should just be able to figure this all out ourselves. Not true, not true, not true. And to me, it is just part of good self-care to work with a coach or work with a therapist on these emotional and mental things that block us the same way we might do it with, you know, a personal trainer in the gym for movement or something like that. Something else we want to learn, go to a cooking class because we want to learn to cook. Like we don't put a stigma on that, right? What? You had to go to a cooking class? Like, no, it's just like, oh, you want to be better at that? Awesome. Go take a class. But when it comes to our mental health, for some reason, <laughs> we have there's a lot of cultural stigma still to it. And so I hope if nothing, you feel liberated um, to I would love the chance to be able to work with you. Um, and so I have the link that you can book a 15 minute call right in the show notes or hop on over to Instagram at Brenda Florida Coach is who I am on Instagram, Brenda Florida Coach. And in my bio, in the link in my bio, you know, is the 15 minute call. You can DM me all kinds of easy ways to get me there on Instagram or go to the show notes here, wherever you're seeing this podcast and you'll find links down there too. And I have a new worksheet out for you. It's my 10 top tips for delight and desire because delight and desire are part of what gives you your blueprint for the truth of who you are. And these habits that you wanna break or start need to be in alignment with those delights and desires. Otherwise you're trying to align to something that's not in your truth. And so that won't be sustainable either. Uh, and so that's how those, these kind of all you know weave in together. And I've got a weekly show now on Instagram at noon on Tuesdays, noon Pacific, so three Eastern. Uh, called Delight and Desire, where I talk about this every week. So you can go to my profile and find those links too in my, my grid there. And, you know, come join me live because delight, following what delights us and what our desires are, are the quickest way to understand what is true for us now. And I always say like delight and desire, that's a river, not a rock. It's not like we figure that out one time and then it never changes, okay? So uh, our delights and desires are fluid. They change, but they are the quickest way into the truth of who we are. And then these habits come up to block us. So that's why this work of using, being able to isolate the thoughts and start to disempower those thoughts is so incredibly powerful. So I hope this resonates. As always, I love your comments. I love your questions. Please reach out to me and I will see you next week in Uncover and Elevate. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Uncover and Elevate. Check out the show notes for tons of great information and resources like 
If you're interested in being a guest on the podcast so we can uncover and elevate an issue in your life, just complete the form in the show notes. You can follow me on Instagram at Brenda Florida Coach. You can work with me one-on-one or get additional information about one of my group or private retreats by completing the form in the show notes. And I would love it if you would share this episode on social and tag me. I'd also love for you to post a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. It makes such a big difference and will help others find the show. And I'll be incredibly grateful. This is Brenda Florida, Certified Life Coach, and I'll see you in the next episode of Uncover and Elevate.